Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I like trying to spread the word of good sports nutrition far and wide, so the more I can, the better. <clears throat> so um, thank you, Dr. Sutton. Thank you, HSS. So uh, nothing to disclose. Uh, I'm going to go through this uh, relatively quickly so we can get some good Q&A um, with the group. So again, just do a brief talk on Sports Nutrition 101. And then with that, get into some myths uh, that may be uh, going around about sports nutrition and kind of clear them up or clarify them better. So the first thing I want to touch on is a concept that I call the fueling performance pyramid. And so we talk about building this pyramid from the bottom up to have a solid base. The first part is what's called fundamental nutrition, uh, just eating good, healthy foods uh, for general health, body composition, and your immune system. So an athlete who is sick, an athlete who is injured, uh, cannot be an effective athlete athlete. So you've got to be healthy first, then you can put on the performance nutrition piece, which is what do I have before the workout, what do I have after the workout, what do I have during. Um, and then finally, once those are all working well, supplements or supplemental nutrition, which can be very specific to certain conditions or demands. So just touching on what is those fundamental nutrition pieces that I look at and I ask for my athletes to have. So again, adequate calories for healthy weight maintenance and physical function, really trying to say like, are you fueling your body the way it needs to do to achieve uh, you know, the ability to do all the work it's being asked of it and to also function healthfully. In other words, are all of your body systems working? Um, are you getting all the normal things that should be going on in your body? Are you not getting sick? Are you getting adequate carbohydrates, adequate fuel for your training demands? Um, and then adequate protein spaced evenly throughout the day. Uh, the key is you want to have uh, an, a certain amount, but not too much. So more isn't always better, but you definitely want to have enough and having it evenly spaced throughout the day every three, four, five hours max uh, to maximize muscle protein synthesis. Next, looking at having veggies and fruits and healthy fats with at least two meals or snacks a day. So I'm saying if you've got breakfast, lunch, dinner, and maybe one or two snacks, you want to see veggies at two of them, fruits at two of them, healthy fats, talking about nuts, salmon, seeds, uh, avocado, olive oils, with at least two of those as well. <clears throat> being attentive to maybe certain key vitamins and minerals, especially in target populations. So again, endurance athletes, making sure your iron is up, especially uh, female endurance athletes, um, vitamin D, getting, uh, making sure you're having it enough, uh, especially if you're indoors a lot, uh, northern, you know, kind of uh, higher latitudes, um, winter time, stuff like that, calcium for bone health, vitamin C, especially for stressful training periods, um, and then more to consider if you're vegetarian or vegan, B12, et cetera. And then making sure that you have adequate hydration, that again, you're going to the bathroom urinating uh, relatively frequently, um, and that when you do, your urine is straw yellow or lighter. Um, a good way to look at how much I should be eating or how my distribution should be is a good, we have these great uh, resources from USOC Sports Nutrition Group, uh, US Olympic Committee. So if you look at an easy training day or for weight management, you'll see how the whole grain is really kind of just that top quarter of the plate, a lot of fruits and vegetables, um, and then some protein as well. Uh, so if you go to a hard day, watch how much the whole grains really takes up a lot more of the plate. You add on some fruit on the side. So you see how much more. So again, looking at the less here for the easy training day and a lot more on the harder training day because your body needs that more fuel because you're training multiple hours a day on the hard training day or race day, whereas you only may be doing a light workout or just some technique work on the easier day. So you're fueling your body for what it needs and not what it doesn't. So it's about optimizing. If we look at some example needs, someone who's training two hours uh, in a day, pretty lean individual, uh, 176 pounds, so definitely going to be kind of a, a teenager, adolescent, or older athlete. Um, it's a lot of food, especially if you're going with the recommended um, – carbs. So 530 grams. It's a lot of carbs, as you can see. It's a lot of food. So again, I want people to be realistic about this is a huge demand on a person's body if they're training super hard and they're going to need to eat the part. Also, on the flip side, you need to consider that if someone comes in and they're having issues and their diet looks good, they might just not be eating enough, even though the quality of their diet is good. So you say, oh, I'm eating some salmon, I'm eating some vegetables, but maybe you're just not eating enough if you're really feeling tired and low because you're training super hard, but you're not taking in enough. 
I want you to consider creating a healthy eating environment for yourself. So the idea is you have all these recommendations and then what do I do with it? How do I make it realistic to me as an individual? When I work with athletes, this is the stuff that I really dig into during my consults with them. What are your preferences? What's your schedule? Where are you going to be? Are you at school? Are you in the morning? Do you have short mornings where you just have to be up and out of the door right away within a half hour? So you have to grab something quick. Do you have more time in the morning? Do you have good lunch options at school? Maybe not. Uh, do you have any snack options? Can you eat during or between classes? Sometimes a lot of athletes and a lot of kids just can't eat for a really long time because they're not allowed to. Um, when are your practices? Are they early in the morning? Are they later in the day? Um, do you have some two days? Um, and then what is your hydration like? Can you carry a water bottle with you? And then what about those weekends, right? So is your weekends different? Is there more training? Do you have more free time? And what we really want to do is what I have in the bottom left, make the healthy choice the easy choice. That is the key. So now going to performance nutrition, we want to talk about fueling time frame. So we're talking about before, one to three hours prior, during, and then after, again, about that hour or so after. A lot of the things are the same, carbs, protein, fluid, electrolytes. Uh, so the primary electrolyte is sodium and salt. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're getting in a snack beforehand, something during, especially if it's going to be more than an hour or 90 minutes that you're including some carbs, um, and then having something similar afterwards. So we'll dig in a little deeper here. So again, looking at pre-practice, carbs, moderate protein, lower fat and fiber for people with sensitive stomachs. Some people can put away the peanut butter. Some people are going to have a really bad stomach ache afterwards as well. Salads are great. You may not want to have a huge salad an hour before you go train. Again, everyone's different. If you have a sensitive stomach, sometimes having a liquid is easier to digest. It's more easily tolerated. Making sure you're getting in some amount of fluid, 12 to 20 ounces. Think about a typical Poland spring bottle of water. Um, and then a source of sodium. So sometimes that comes with the food. Um, and then on the right side, you have food ideas to do. Uh, test it out before game day or race day so you're not trying something new uh, when it counts. And the little kind of phrase I use is the more weight, the longer waiting between eating and competing, the more food you're going to need. So maybe a snack if it's like an hour or two before you go, but more of a meal if it's going to take three or four hours before you're able to actually start training. All right. So during practice, again, we're talking about the big three, fluid, carbs, and electrolytes. If it's a shorter duration, you're going to be able to do fine with just fluid. Um, as the duration gets longer, as it gets more hot and humid, then you start to need to increase the amount you need for electrolytes, for, for carbohydrates as well. Uh, research will generally show you want to try to uh, consume or have something during practice every 15 to 20 minutes. Um, versus waiting for a long time, uh, we can fall behind, or trying to do too short of a time and your body isn't able, able to actually absorb it effectively. Uh, again, there's different ideas of how you can do it. Listen to your body. If you're taking a lot of fluid and then you feel like you've got uh, a ton of fluid sloshing around in your stomach, maybe that's too much. Um, so it's something to consider. Also, just being mindful of the signs and symptoms of dehydration and heat stress, especially if you're going to be outside, hard training, especially pads, helmets, stuff like that. Uh, you really just want to be sure that you're aware of that you're getting frequent breaks to be able to stay hydrated um, and that if you are getting these symptoms and it's not normal, um, again, getting it checked out, getting somewhere cooler, uh, taking yourself out. Again, you know, coaches and stuff like that are trying to uh, be aware of these things and, and monitor them. After practice, the easiest thing I tell people is whatever you do before practice, you can repeat it after practice. Uh, it's the same general concept of what's required, uh, just putting back those same things, carbs, protein, fluid, and uh, electrolytes or sodium. Next, I just want to give a quick example. These are things you can do. So if you have lunch at 12 at school, maybe a pre-practice snack at 2, you practice from 4 to 6, and then you get a quick snack on the way home and then eat dinner. On the flip side, you can do the same thing for waking up, have a little snack before practice, practice, have a good uh, breakfast afterwards. So another thing we want to talk about, recovery is not just nutrition. It's super important to get your body ready to go um, for the next training session, the next day, especially if you're doing a lot of day in and day out training, that you're getting adequate sleep. Again, we're talking about ideally at least eight, uh, especially for uh, young athletes, adolescents uh, who are growing even nine plus if you're training really hard. Um, and stress, minimizing stress. So your body doesn't really know the difference between 
uh, physical stress of hard training, mental stress of I got a deadline, I've got a, a report due soon, I've got final exams. Your body's taking on all that stress um, the same way, and so it adds up. So anything you can do to minimize stress or kind of mitigate it uh, through things that can chill you out and, and relax you will help a lot with recovery. So again, touching on supplemental nutrition, we just want to say these are the three things you have to ask about supplements. Um, is it effective? I can tell you, you could really count on maybe a, a one dozen or so tops, you know, 10, 12 supplements that have been fully researched and said that these are effective for particular situations. Um, and I will also say, going into the futures, none of these things have really been studied in depth in a uh, pediatric population. Most studies have been done on people 18 plus for uh, reasons because of all the issues with uh, kind of pediatric and, and minor studies. Um, is it safe? So again, you know, sometimes things are effective, uh, but they're not really safe. And so the biggest example is something like steroids. Um, but then is it pure? So you can also say, all right, I have this great uh, substance, it's going to work for me, but is the manufacturer who's putting this pill or this powder into your into this bottle are they actually putting in what they're saying they're putting in and unfortunately there's a lot of research showing that that's not always the case so it's really important that you get a good manufacturer um, so here's some resources for you so third-party testing nsf for sport informed choice these are organizations that will uh, test uh, products from manufacturers who send them batches and say, you can test my product to make sure it is what it says it is, um, and then they report it. Again, they can't test every single bottle, but they're letting them be tested to a certain amount so you can feel a little more confident on it. Um, on the bottom, the Australian Institute of Sport does some great guidelines on uh, research about um, supplements that actually have good research uh, behind them. Um, so definitely check them out. They kind of go group A, group B, group C, group D. Uh, group A is the one with the most amount of research. It's really about a dozen things tops. Uh, it's not a lot. Uh, last thing as far as the basics is keeping a journal or tracking your progress. The best way to understand how to make yourself better is to understand what you've done and where you've been so you can make a plan for moving forward. Um, so again, it can be simple. This is something we do with to tracking, uh, uh, you know, kind of someone's progress or how they're feeling in a high demand sport. Um, so again, we're looking at what their training hours are like, what their sleep hours are like, what their morning resting heart rate, soreness and fatigue from a one to 10 scale. So we're really trying to see how someone's doing. It's a great early warning indicator if someone's morning resting heart rate is going up, soreness and fatigue are going up, and their mood is lousy, that maybe they're starting to do a little bit of overtraining and we need to pull it back. The great thing about this is if you're tracking and you see something go out of whack, you can usually get it uh, kind of under control before someone gets sick or injured. So again, having some of this information can be very, very helpful to understand where someone's at and how to maximize their adaptation um, and improve their recovery. So stepping into a few myths, and then we'll open up for some Q&A. So again, sometimes people think nutrition doesn't matter. You know, it, I'll eat whatever I need as, as long as I train and, and do what I got to do, I'll be fine. And so it's interesting, you know, I think when people are younger, um, I think you can get away with more. The two slide, the, the two pictures I have on this slide are what Michael Phelps's eating habits were in 2008 when he was in his uh, kind of early to mid 20s in that 12,000 calories a day. And then um, on the bottom right is his uh, diet when he was in his 30s in 2016, uh, when he also got many, many golds. Um, and he even said himself, like, you I'm in a different body now. And so I kind of tell people this concept of longevity, the ability to be an athlete for a long time. You start looking at all these athletes, you know, LeBron James, um, you know, all these athletes that are just really trying to focus on staying great for a long time. They will all tell you that nutrition is a huge factor and a huge role in what they do. Um, again, it's about maximizing performance. You can probably be good at a lot of things, but if you dial in the nutrition, you can go from good to great. Um, endurance nutrition is super important. So if you're doing Ironman, marathons, things like that, if you don't have the nutrition, you're going to probably bunk. So again, these are all pieces and factors that you can consider that are very meaningful for having good nutrition. Myth number two, Carbs, animal protein, you know, with the uh, with game changers coming out, um, you know, toward the end of last year, beginning of this year, a lot of people started asking me about, oh, should I go vegan? Is that the best way to go? Um, you know, anything, XYZ, is, is the devil, it's the worst thing for you. And I kind of tell people it's all individual. 
Um, there's a lot of reasons why you may or may not want to make a change or cut out a certain area. But the thing I tell people is if you choose to cut out a whole food group, you are losing out on a potential source of certain nutrients. So again, if you're missing out on protein, if you're missing out on total calories, if you're missing out on calcium or something like that, you need to be mindful of where you're getting those nutrients in. So sometimes you have to cut it out because you have a true allergy or a food sensitivity where really you're getting negative symptoms. So there's no point in eating something if it really makes you physically ill every time you eat it um, or a medical condition. If you have uh, inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, so like you see ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's disease, things like that, where you just have to take it out. And then there's personal preference or experience where you know it just works better for you. Those are all areas where you might choose something out, but you can say cut and dried carbs are horrible for everybody. Animal protein is horrible for everybody. There's plenty of nutrients you get from there, but again, a lot of it comes down to personal choice and fitting a plan that works to the person because we need the nutrients we need to perform our best. Uh, myth number three, I need this supplement to do well, that this supplement is going to make me the best. No, it's the fundamental nutrition. It's the performance nutrition. Those are the things that are 98% of your results. If you are not tip top in your fundamental nutrition that we talked about before, if you're not tip top in fueling your performance before, during, and after, focus that. That is the bigger results for you there doing that day in and day out. Is it easy? No. But is it more effective if you do it? Yes. Really research that even the best supplements out there, the ones that are proven, they give you two to 3% boost. So literally if it's coming down to the gold and you're going to win by a 10th of a second, yeah, this 2% can make the difference. But again, that's just the last little bit of all of it. Keep in mind, it's not really studied in athletes under 18. Um, again, few supplements are truly proven to work. We're talking about a, do a dozen or so tops. Um, caveat emptor. So really buyer beware. So again, you got to know what you're buying is pure. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of uh, organizations that are very, very strict about their uh, substance abuse and use. And so whether it's the NCAA, whether it's Tennis Federation, again, Maria Sharapova, she tested positive for something that had become a banned substance that year. She had to Google it to know that it was a banned substance and what she was actually taking. So again, it's really the sort of thing where it's not even always the athletes knowingly doing it. It just happens. And unfortunately, you're still going to get in trouble. So again, you have to be very mindful of if you're going to choose to have a supplement. Next thing, I need more protein to bulk up. I get this all the time when people want to come in, try and get bigger, put on some lean mass. Oh, I just start eating more protein. It's not about protein to get bigger. It's about calories. You need to be taking in more calories than you're burning to gain mass. Of course, you need adequate protein, but rarely do I see athletes in this situation not taking in enough protein. They're just not taking enough calories. So they're pounding four extra protein shakes a day, but each protein shake is only 150 calories because it's just protein. So they're only taking in 600 more calories when they need actually more like another 1,500 calories per day instead of just 600. So on the one side, you see Conor McGregor. He uh, used to just kind of focus on like steak, 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 meat, meat, meat. He's leveled up uh, to higher weight categories now, and he's really focused on actually just expanding his general food intake, um, still eating plenty of protein, um, but eating more. And then if you look at the other gentleman, uh, Rob Gronkowski, he actually eats 75% or so. They, were, they asked him about his diet and he eats about 75% of his diet from plant-based foods. Okay. So a lot of the foods you're eating are plant-based. He is a tall, big guy. He's six something. I think he's six, five, six, six. He's 255, 265 pounds playing weight. So you can be big and eat plants and be very healthy and have protein as well. So again, I'm not trying to push one side or the other. I'm just trying to make you realize that there's a lot of ways to get to where you want to be. There's not just one way. The key is about understanding what you need to get and being consistent with it. Last thing, I need to look like that person to be a good athlete. So again, body composition, physique, these things, certainly some sports, there is some kind of aspects of scoring on it, but really it's more about your performance right so you look at some of these athletes you see simone biles look how strong her legs are she just flies in the air she would not be able to fly in the air and do what she does without those strong legs in the middle you see bartolo cologne he has some of the best like endurance record as far as being able to pitch in the major leagues for years and years and years with really very little injury so again, you don't have to be this like ripped, shredded person to be a great athlete in all performances. And lastly, we have Muhammad Ali. Again, he's not ripped and shredded, but he can certainly throw a punch. So again, I would not want to be in the ring with him. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my uh, presentation. Thank you very much.
Tune in next week for our 30-Minute Thursdays broadcasted by HSS. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.